the planning board meeting of Tuesday, September 26th. Um, we have a little bit of uh, internal business to take care of, and then we have a public meeting on, on the complete streets. Um, under planning board business and policies, uh, one of the things that will be going to town meeting is the acceptance of Autumn Lane, which we've been told the planning board has voted for. Uh, but uh, we need to sign the approval on the uh, submitted plan. So I'll pass this around. Uh, it's a procedural thing. Board is left in the to approve this thing. I want to say that, The other piece of business is uh, in your material is the uh, schedule of bills and warrants. We have a total uh, amount being paid of $4,123.11. Uh, 3400 of that is uh, roughly is our, uh, out of our budget. The rest of the revolving accounts. Actually, I'm sorry. I, I, this is a little confusing the way I did it. It's Joe, I apologize. You weren't here at the last meeting. We didn't approve the payroll from last time. So I put it on the first column is payroll from the previous <coughs> meeting. And then the payroll from this, this past week's payroll is on the second column. And then the revolving accounts are split out. So basically, you're left total the 3000 Oh, I see. Okay. So, so we're, last, last we're paying month. bills. So it's a total of 7000 and then this much is yeah, but is this part of the forty-one hundred dollars? Just to let you know, it's thirty-four hundred plus the thirty-four hundred to make seven thousand five hundred. Right. The forty-one hundred includes three eighty-one and two sixty-five. It does. Correct. Part of the so basically, we're paying, we're asking for approval for payment of two two bill schedules: that of nine twelve and that of nine twenty-six. We're paying nine twelve and nine twenty-six. Uh, so combined, that's seven thousand five hundred four dollars and eight nine cents. Are there any questions? Do we need two okay. motions for those? Or just no, one? I think we can just, just one make one. We make a motion. We approve the seven thousand five hundred forty dollars and eighty nine cents for the payroll of September twelfth and September twenty sixth. Second. As well as There's been a motion, and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. It for our piece of uh, business. Um, another 10 months. So I believe the public meeting for Complete Street Safe House to School is supposed to be at 7:30. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule with that. Um, I can tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. No, I can't but I will at least introduce um, who's here tonight to speak on behalf of Complete Streets and Safe Routes to School. Um, so we have Jed Kornock, who is the Principal Comprehensive Planner with CERPED. Um, he has over a decade of transportation and comprehensive planning experience and has worked with a variety of federal, state, and local stakeholders on a number of products. He has experience with updating master plans, writing zoning amendments, and housing production plans, as well as running traffic operation analysis, completing roadway and intersection safety audits, and conducting bicycle and pedestrian assessments. Jed is here tonight to explain how Norton is participating in our <coughs> streets program. So just stand up and he'll be talking in a few minutes. And then we also are having uh, representatives from the state, Moss Lynch and Nikki Tischler, and I don't believe they're here yet, but they'll be speaking on behalf of St. Rouse to School. Um, so, I, I guess we'll just have to start. I realize my keys are um, So why don't I just kick it off? <coughs> um, so tonight we're talking about complete streets and safe routes to school because Norton has signed what is called a community compact. So the community compact, just to explain to you, is a Massachusetts initiative. It's a voluntary mutual program that's entered into between the administration, the governor, I think that was a lot of, like, hold on just a minute. Just tell stories. I think we were talking about Canada. 
<laughs> or not. Is that without other handouts on the table over there? Yes, there are. Okay. Folks, if there's, uh, you don't have handouts, there are some on the table there. and we have a nice signed um, document that Mike is going in our town hall that says that we've done this and we've set best management practices. So when they have, the Commonwealth has the, the communities enter into this compact, they're telling us that if you implement this best, best practice, we will give you incentives and goodies to participate. So we get extra points for grant, um, grant submittals, um, state incentives, things like that. So this is a good thing for Norton. These, pro these programs are going to enable us to be able to get money for our town and to better our municipality. So it's a participatory thing. We voluntarily agreed to it with our board of selectmen and that happened last year. So we set the two best practices that we wanted to strive towards as transportation and citizen safety goals. And the first one was complete streets. And that is that we will, we promise to become certified through MassDOT and demonstrate the regular and routine inclusion of complete streets design elements and infrastructure on locally funded roads. And Jed is going to explain a little bit more about the complete streets program. But if Keith Silver was here tonight, he would say we've been already asking people to do this. This is something that we said when we sit down with developers, um, we want you to look into this and it's been something that we promote that we want there to be safety for all modes of tra transportation. So just to consider putting some kind of accommodation for those who are in wheelchairs, uh, children, rollerbladers, bicyclists, people walking to, to the grocery store, things like that. And then the second goal that we had was the transportation citizen safety goal of safe routes to school. Um, and our superintendent is here tonight showing his support. You should sit. I'm very comfortable right now. <laughs> <laughs> we've been um, all day. And we promise that the community will show evidence of a comprehensive safe routes to school program. And the program will also include student education on pedestrian safety. And when Moss and um, Nikki show, which she will be doing shortly, they're going to be the coordinators working with the schools. And they've already sent out a survey that they're going to be talking about tonight um, to put together programs to. Um, empower children and their parents to walk and, and to think about other modes of transportation because we know that there's these long um, lines at the school to pick up kids and we have a community that is a beautiful rural community and people can be walking to school safely. So at this time I'm going to ask Jed to uh, talk about complete streets and I'll pass it off to him. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is Jed Kornack. I'm a principal comprehensive planner at Circa. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I do want to direct your attention uh, to the two handouts that are on the table. Uh, the first is the draft complete streets policy, which we'll be talking about uh, just in a few minutes. And then the other is a copy of that board, um, which sort of outlines the uh, idea of accommodating uh, different types of users. So I think we should start off by introducing CERPED. For those of you who, who don't know, CERPED is your regional planning agency. We're one of 13 uh, planning agencies in the Commonwealth. We serve 27 uh, uh, municipalities in the southeastern Mass region. If you drew a line from Plainville down to basically Wareham, we cover all of that area. We provide uh, planning services and technical assistance for, for those member municipalities. Uh, focused on, as you can see here, land use, housing, economic development, uh, environmental protection, and transportation. Um, so why is CERPED here to help you uh, in the Complete Streets program? Tabitha sort of focused on that a little bit um, just, uh, just now. Uh, I'll add that uh, district local technical assistance funding really helps doing that. That's the funding mechanism for the Community Compact Cabinet to allow regional planning agencies like ourselves to help member municipalities who participate in that cabinet program um, implement their best practices. And your best practice uh, that I'll be talking tonight about is complete streets. Here we are. 
uh, the DLTA program funded you to get through Tier 1. It's the first level uh, of the Mass DOT Complete Streets Funding Program. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we can sort of talk about the uh, items in your, uh, in your policy. So we'll start with the basics. Um, what is a complete street? Well, it's a facility that safely and comfortably accommodates all users, regardless of age or ability, um, and mm -hmm. mode of transportation. Uh, put simply, it's a facility that um, you know, folks such as motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians, uh, public transportation providers, school buses, everyone can use. Uh, one of the first questions I always get when you know, describing complete streets to uh, people is, is every road going to be a complete street? And the, and the simple answer is, no, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and I'll direct your attention to that board, because it really, and your handout, uh, it really talks about um, the differences in accommodations, because every street serves a different function. Um, and the highest and preferred alternative is that everyone has their own space. Uh, cars have, cars and motorists have their travel lane, and bicyclists have perhaps a bike lane and a shoulder area. And then pedestrians have a dedicated sidewalk. Well, we live in New England, right? <laughs> and so sometimes those situations are hard to, uh, to come by. So the idea is to try and accommodate as best you can all users using the right of way that you have. Some of the benefits, some of these are really obvious. Um, improved safety uh, for those uh, pedestrians who walk in the roadway because there's not a sidewalk, then you do provide one. Obviously, it's a safer accommodation. Um, it improves accessibility, provides that mode choice. Um, driving everywhere we go sometimes creates things that we may not uh, like uh, as much as we'd, you know, we'd like to be uh, better, uh, in better shape and, and providing the ability to bike or walk to places instead of taking your car at, um, is an obvious benefit. Uh, but then there's also the idea of sustainability. Uh, so there's a lot of communities who, because uh, they rely completely on the motor uh, vehicle, they, they have lost their, um, their economic development in their downtowns. And so providing that mode choice, providing people with the opportunity to bike and walk to those facilities um, is actually proven to be uh, a way to increase <coughs> economic development. So some of the elements, they're really easy. Um, you have uh, ADA compliant curb ramps. That is to say that every curb ramp has a uh, specific width uh, and depth. It provides a, um, a truncated dome uh, for the visually impaired. Uh, they can be elements such as curb extensions. You can see it on that image there. Um, bicycle lanes or... Can you explain what truncated dome is? Truncated dome. So when it's a um, elevated surface, it's a panel at the end of the curb ramp, that has um, a little, uh, how do you describe it? They're um, yeah. textured, it's a textured, <laughs> exactly, little bumps uh, for visually impaired individuals. So when they come to it, they can drag their cane across it and, in, and it indicates uh, the end of a sidewalk and they're about to enter into the uh, crosswalk. Bus shelters, pull out areas, signage, and lighting. Uh, many other items, those are just the, the main ones. So in order to incentivize, as I mentioned before, uh, participation in the program, MassDOT uh, put together this Complete Streets Funding Program. So in a nutshell, what it says is if you participate, you can um, apply for up to $400,000 in construction funds. And this is a screenshot of their website, masscompletestreets.com. Um, as a every municipality, you can enter into the portal that's where all the communication happens between you and MassDOT. You can see the status of the program on their interactive map. And there's a um, whole host of resource materials uh, found on that website as well. This is a screen that, capture. Yeah, for the funding that you mentioned, the 400000 is that a one time per town the annual, or how does that work? It is. So you're capped at 400000 okay. So you can apply multiple times depending on the, the cost of your project but you can only go up to 400,000 in that program. Okay, thank you. In the whole program or one year? In the whole program. So this is a screen capture of the interactive map. <coughs> this is as of Friday, so you can see the participation statewide. Uh, 
really quickly here. The yellow indicates um, uh, municipalities who are participating in the program. Green generally indicates that they have a complete streets policy and a list of projects. And then yellow uh, indicates that they are um, or have received money to do construction projects. So the program itself is divided into three tiers. Tier one is where the town of Norton is currently. Um, you must attend a complete streets training. Um, there are two levels of training, an introductory and advanced training. Uh, the DPW uh, attended one of those trainings, so you've checked that box. Um, and then uh, you must adopt a complete streets policy. The complete streets policy, as I mentioned before, is, is here tonight. And the purpose of tonight's meeting is for all of you to provide input um, on that policy. The, the components of the policy we'll go, uh, go through it in just a minute. Tier two is when you start putting together the list of projects. Uh, those projects are generally grouped into uh, smaller type things, you know, uh, adding uh, curb ramps at this location, providing sidewalks at that location, perhaps adding a bicycle lane uh, from point A to point B, uh, with the idea that uh, if you want to go beyond that 400,000, that that's your sort of capital improvement program uh, going forward. Uh, and they set it up to be a five-year um, program. Now, you'll see here on the slide that you can receive technical assistance funding. It's capped at $50,000 per community. And Morton successfully um, uh, secured uh, $38,000, I believe. And Circuit will be helping uh, Norton uh, put together that project list. Tier three is when you apply for construction funds. Again, you're capped at that $400,000. So tonight is really important. This is the requirement of the program. It must satisfy a public meeting. After that public meeting, uh, the policy then goes to the selectmen. The selectmen sign off, and uh, it gets submitted through the online portal. So. As I mentioned before, the um, website has this guidance document, and it really outlines all of the information that you need to know about the funding program. This slide uh, shows you how MassDOT scores your policy. So they'll, once it's submitted from the portal, they'll look through it. Each of these um, main bold items uh, are uh, scored individually. Vision and intent carries 10 points. It's really what is the vision of the of the municipality um, dealing with complete streets. Your core commitment is really where you get into <coughs> identifying the users and modes, just like I talked about before, bicycles, pedestrians, transit users, etc. Projects and phases, that's where you identify the types of projects, be it uh, new construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, maintenance. Uh, and then the phases is uh, design, construction, and planning. Exceptions is, a, is an important uh, component because that outlines how, as I mentioned before, not every road is going to have every accommodation. And where there's um, need to file an exception or a variance, if you will, uh, it outlines the process uh, for doing so. And then you have uh, best practices. So MassDOT wants to see that you have identified uh, the need to complete a comprehensive network rather than doing uh, spot improvements throughout the community. Uh, talks about jurisdiction. Who will um, comply with this policy? Is it all private developers? Is it public entities, etc.? Then there's the design. There's uh, several design guides that um, highlight different uh, elements that uh, can be used in the Complete Streets program. Identifying those, um, those manuals or guidance documents is important. Identifying that it's context sensitive, again, everything depends on the available right of way that you have or the um, quality of the neighborhood, et cetera. And then identifying performance measures. How are you going to measure your performance going forward? Um, and some of the ones that are outlined in the policy are, for example, uh, new uh, linear, linear feet of sidewalk that has been added in this year, uh, number of curb ramps that have been approved, perhaps new bicycle accommodations, those types of things. And then the implementation really is a, is a core principle of how are we going to implement or how is Morton going to implement this, this policy. And uh, just a, an example of that is uh, by training uh, town staff in what complete streets are and how to comply with the policy. 
so this is just a screenshot of um, the actual snapshot of how <coughs> MassDOT will look at that um, uh, policy when it's submitted. And again, it really just outlines what I just discussed. So tier two is when you get into identifying the projects. So this is where this is essentially a spreadsheet that gets submitted to MassDOT. Uh, it's not meant to be read tonight, but the um, point of these three three next slides is to um, outline the uh, elements of it. So you have project details. Uh, you have to rank the projects. You have to give it a name, a short description, uh, identify whether or not it's located in the environmental justice area. Moving to the to the right, um, where its location where it's to and from, identifying uh, where the project came from. Was it from the needs assessment that was done uh, as part of the um, drafting of the list, or was it from a capital improvement plan uh, or any other master plan document that, uh, that the town may have? And then it's um, identifying the eligible type. So the master team, what they've done is put together a list of projects that are eligible for this program. They've given it a code, you simply just select uh, which one it satisfies and, and enter it into the spreadsheet. Then there's the uh, core needs. Does it address uh, a safety concern? Does it improve mobility? You then have to come up with an estimated project cost. Um, outline how much of the funding of that 400000 you're planning on using for that particular project. Uh, it can be all at one project or it can be spread out throughout the entire five-year plan. It's completely up to the town. And then you have to identify the construction start date and how long it's been anticipating it to, to run. Generally, these projects are running anywhere between eight months. Um, and some of the costs are very large and some of them are, are very small. It all depends on the municipality. Then there's tier three. This is really jumping ahead, but this is where you then uh, submit your application to MassDOT and apply for that $400,000. Uh, the four bullets up at the top identify the four components of the application itself. MassDOT then reviews that application, takes approximately a month and a half. Um, they then, the municipality enters into a contract and then it's a reimbursement program. This is the eligible project list. Um, again, ranging from things such as intersection improvements, um, dedicated bicycle lanes, perhaps uh, providing new sidewalks or new curb ramps, etc. So that sort of encapsulates what's the, or what the MassDOT Complete uh, Funding Program is. Um, I can answer any questions if you'd like about the individual policy, and I'm sure staff would love to jump in as well. Um, but again, uh, tonight's meeting is about making sure that we uh, get as much input on that policy as possible. So I believe, Jed, did you read copies of the policy? I did. So there. we have a final draft of the policy that's available on the table over there. Um, this has been circulated through the staff department heads and in the town, um, but we would love your input, and that's what tonight's about. So if anyone has questions or comments on what they want to see as part of this complete streets piece, speak up. Hi, right, Sawyer's late, or Flyer's at 7.30. Um, so I bike to work. I work at the Norton Middle School, and it's not safe. <laughs> um, so thankfully, we just got Plain Street done, so I take the side roads because mm -hmm. you all have been on 123. Um, but I also have two children. Right. They're not leaving my street because they like that. So my goal is to somehow get it safe so we can leave our short street and walk around town, which is awesome. Um, so I don't know what feedback you're looking for, but that's what I'm that's starting with. looking for, so if anybody else has comments like that, we want to hear Thank you. Peter. Yes, I'm Peter J. Wiggins. I'm for that. I'm a lifelong resident. I'm an avid walker. And I walk the streets of Norton, and I walk a lot of streets, and 140 has no sidewalks, so it is about time that... 140 can get sidewalks and 140s get sidewalks from Reservoir Street down to downtown Norton. And you know what it means sidewalks? Bay Road because it's a historic road road in it. And I walk there and I have no problems walking there, but it needs sidewalks. Right? So we'll definitely keep you in the loop here as we develop the prioritization plan. So 
Jack, you gave us that spreadsheet, but we'll, we'll be developing a list of where in town we want to see things happen first and then prioritizing them. So you know, listing them from 1 to 10 and MassDOT, MassDOT will be giving, you know, will be eligible for this money, but we also want to keep it on the radar of the town. Thank you. Do you think we should be starting with things that we can control now rather than something that we can't control for a year or two? Speed limits, cars speeding down Plain Street. I live 100 yards from Elgin Ross. I can't walk my son to school. So some of the elements that are included in that project list or those eligible projects can actually help with uh, traffic calming. So an eligible project may be a speed hump. I know those are speed tables are also effective. OK, I, to go on further, we have the um, school zones, 20 mile an hour school zones. They haven't been working in six months. You can definitely bring that up to the highway department. So thank you for bringing that. So would this funding also include uh, for new signage? Yes. Yes. Because we desperately need it on Plain Street, uh, updated uh, signage. Uh, I think that would be um, in uh, that many other towns have where they have alert systems, especially in the school zone. We have a, a very serious uh, speeding problem on Main Street. Mm -hmm. So we want to do everything we can to resolve that with the uh, new signage. Possibly even little warning alerts that say slow down. Yep. Great. Uh, and I think adding to that comment, you know, when you've got a school, no matter where it is, you need a sidewalk. Right. And you know, we've been very negligent for many years having LG North School in Plain Street where they don't even have a sidewalk. If somebody wanted to walk to school, they can't. And I re recall a few years ago where principal insisted that the person who lived two houses down had to be picked up by a bus okay. because there was no bathroom with no sidewalk. And you know, another area that, that we've been pushing for for 100 years is uh, Reservoir Street. A major portion of our uh, population lives in that area. We've got a lot of people living down there. And we know it has sidewalks because of the close proximity to the street and right. the, the, the inability to have, actually have enough space to put any sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And it may, may be uh, unpopular someday to do this, but we have to start looking at it. Especially now that we're looking at a, uh, a bike trail, which will go into that area also. It's only going to add to the, the amount of people using the street. You know, and, and again, we have a lot of young people down in that area. It's going to be a problem, but the number one priority has to be schools. I mean, you have to have decent sidewalks, even on Main Street, West Main Street. You know, our sidewalks aren't that great. And, you know, again, a lot of that state road, by the way, we don't control all of it. And it makes it a bit more difficult, but we should have decent sidewalks, especially on the main, the main roads. One thing to know that the <coughs> money that you're requesting from MassDOT through this program can only be used on local, locally owned roads. Um, and the reason they set that up is because, you know, they're responsible for their roads. They really want to give the money to the municipality, very similar to Chapter 90, um, and allow you to make the improvements that you can do, <coughs> um, and then really push for improvements on, on their facilities as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think an area where Serpent could help us better would be the Chapter 90, especially on the state side, yeah. is that they help us improve our sidewalks on their roads, too. Right. Anytime we call the state for any kind of reason, whether it be traffic lights in the center of town, malfunctioning, or any issues like that, we're pretty much hitting a wall most of the time. And anytime they do improvements on the main street, sidewalks have to be a component of that. And in recent years, I haven't seen much of that happen. So I, I think how Serpa could help us mostly would be to get partner up in small towns and say, okay, you know, we have to, you have sidewalks, let's make them compliant. I believe that the ones further down on West Main Street, heading to the Charlie side of town, probably aren't even compliant to that. It's not wide enough, you know, and, and it's an issue, it's a major issue. And I think that Serpent can help us more by helping us with that part of it, even though that's beyond what you're talking about tonight. I still think it's an area that we could, we could definitely you know, work together on and make some improvements. Sure. Just have one additional. So I, uh, I'm not sure how many roads are actually town-owned and how many are combined state-town. 
So I, I don't know if, uh, if, if, do we have any sort of map, any sort of uh, information that uh, shows exactly how many roads this would actually apply to in, for this program? Well, Route 123 and 140. 123 and 140. Those Everything else pretty much belongs to us. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was going to say that's the first thing that we do, and that will be the first thing we do as part of that tier two. That next step um, is identifying, you know, the roads that you own, and then doing a, a townwide infrastructure assessment. And 123 is just West Main. East Main is ours. Right. Okay. Um, I live on North Worcester Street, which is. Um, it meets 123 white, right where the J.C. Solomon School is. Mm -hmm. And so my sons, my tiny consumers over here, do attend there. And North Worcester Street, I believe, is posted as 35 miles an hour. And as I'm sure they experience on Plain Street, that is often not the case for the cars that drive. I'm also a runner, so I'm very aware of how fast people drive on those streets. And I don't live on Oak Street, but I do run on Oak Street. And I will say how windy it is. Um, and there's lots of places where I know there's blind um, vision, visibility for a driver, particularly at night or at darker times of day, where I'm running towards them and I know they can't see me mm -hmm. coming. So, but for Northwestern in particular, you know, we're a mile from the school, and so of course we uh, are not required to receive busing. So you would assume that then we'd be able to walk to school, but there is absolutely no way I could walk uh, last year a first grader and a third grader to that school with any way to do that so it's been a major concern for us thank you i live in northwest and uh, the lights have been an issue on the corner of northwest and southwestern 123 breaks up old colony to east main street so there isn't a question of what's on that state what's town and what can you really do mm -hmm. uh Serpa did do a study i believe on having a light there just recently we did but the issue is where's the location is it a state issue a town issue that's really an ongoing issue about the uh, investment or upgrade for the town. Sure. We're, so, we're submitting a project notification to the state for a signal there. There is. There is. Yeah. So we're, we're, the we're starting the process to get a signal there with the right. state. Just but everything east of that is town, so therefore sidewalks is a possibility from Salomon School all the way to Premachia. Yeah. Well, that's West. Oh, no, that's West Main. West yeah. Main. Oh, it's West Main. West Main yeah. has the sidewalks, but they're not in yeah. this yeah. area. condition. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. This is East Main. Yeah, my, my dog goes to JCS as well. She's in a wheelchair, and we couldn't, I mean, my house, you can see the school from, from where we live, and we couldn't bring her down the sidewalk there. So, um, as a superintendent, it's always nice to be in an audience that's talking about schools. Um, I think a couple of different things, just as a reminder of the LGN side of town as a state road, as a, as a town road, is about 300 students that are there versus the other 2,200 students that we really can't talk about because they're all on the state on the state road, uh, which is gonna be the Hague, the middle school, the JCS, and even the high school. The high school, um, the middle school, both only have one entrance, one exit, um, which is, I think, something that should be part of looking at safe roads only because um, Right now, the high school dumps into, if you will, the Yell School, which then becomes a double uh, exit for both for both schools. Um, there is a secondary exit in the high school for a potential emergency uh, that cuts through literally across the street from the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I guess my question, Mike, you might know this better than anyone else, but uh, with East Main Street, is that would that be from the college over? Is that considered East Main? That it, from the. 123 140 intersection okay so that's the reason why it was easier for the college to put on the blinking lights crosswalk right. because that's something that could that would be seriously an issue that could be addressed across from the L school we've actually had discussions with the senior center using um, parking across the street at the L school during the day um, where we could potentially do something and that becomes an issue because senior citizens crossing the street is probably not the best idea on 123 especially if you don't have the right signage so the gentleman who spoke earlier about signage within 123, that's a concern that we have, crosswalks are a concern. Um, so any help that we can get with that through you folks would be appreciated. When it comes to Plain Street, um, one of the things I, I think is really important is, I don't know, Mike, if that road is considered now complete with the project down there, 
Um, I'm going to guess that it is, and, and so signage would be something that we uh, would support. We're actually contemplating different exit and entrances at the LGN school for busing and, and cars. Um, we're currently working to, to try to see if there's a better way in and a better way out because there's no parking down there, um, or not a lot of parking down there. Um, and then the the, um, the third part that I had is in, in the, and in briefly just going through the, um, the, um, the economic plan um, policy, I guess one of my concerns would be cost of environmental impacts of accommodate and accommodations, considering that we have a high water table in town and there's some lands that are probably um, pretty close to areas that the economic impact would be probably a financial hindrance uh, to a project. And I, I, I don't know the town as well as maybe I should as your superintendent, but you know, as I drive through, I see areas of town where how does the sidewalk go in there with not without impacting the reservoir area, as an example, without impacting all kinds of economic studies. Um, and I, you know, I hate to see money just thrown at economic studies that we probably are, uh, that we, environmental studies that we know that economically are probably not going to impact sure. the potential for a sidewalk or the potential for widening a road, um, et cetera. So that, that element that you're describing there actually is, is built-in flexibility. So what it says is, um, if you're proposing a project at this location and the environmental impacts of doing that type of improvement, for example, widening the roadway or adding a sidewalk um, are cost prohibitive, um, then it's, it's allowed as an exception, meaning that you know, you're not going to require someone or the town itself to put things in where uh, they simply can't. And so my last, my last comment would be that, um, as I suggested earlier, that the, the ideas of, of any type of town property, I guess, since because the, the state becomes more of a complicated issue there, crosswalks, those types of lights are used down at, um, uh, for example, at the LGN, it would be those types of, of crosswalk lights would be appropriate with a crosswalk, in my opinion, even if you're not yet at a, um, don't yet have a sidewalk or a proper sidewalk. Um, and then the speeding signs, um, those types of things would be helpful as well in, on, in that area of town, as well as North River, um, uh, Northwest, excuse me, um, because that can be a, a road where people are flying, uh, coming down towards uh, the school section. So. You also have people cutting through the uh, JCS, taking it around that intersection there. Yeah, we, we've, had, we've had great communication with our PD when it comes yes. to that. We've seen a lot less this year than yeah, in the prior years, our police department really helped us with that. Obviously, this falls into the same vein of talking about speeding and signage, but I think uh, John Scott Boulevard is another place for that, especially heading towards Taunton. I, mean, I think a month ago, it was a fatal rollover crash there. Uh, I guess somebody was going too fast. Um, and I know from living on that street that People often don't stop at the stop sign at John Scott at Harvey because um, there's no way they'd be going that fast past my house if they did. <laughs> so. Well, I'm going to take that pause to mean that it's time for safe routes to school. So thank you, Jed. I'm going to now introduce our next speaker. So the next, uh, we have two representatives from the state here for Safe Routes to School. We have Nikki Tischler, who is Mascot Safe Routes to School Coordinator in the Office of Transportation. <coughs> she is also a Title VI strategist, which I think is civil rights. Civil rights, thank you. Focusing on civil rights compliance and public participation, she will discuss the Safe Routes to School program and upcoming opportunities to utilize federal funding. We also have Moss Lynch, who is a Safe Routes to School Outreach Coordinator for Southeastern Mass, so you might see more of him. He will, has been with the program for two years and specializes in education courses such as pedestrian and bike safety, as well as Safe Routes events such as the International Walk to School Day and the Walking School Bus Creation, which sounds fun. He's here tonight to discuss the evaluation of the parent surveys and answer questions about how to turn data into results. So I'll pass it on to you. Perfect, thank you. 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, so I am the uh, outreach coordinator, or, I'm sorry, I'm the Sacred to School coordinator for MassDOT. Moss is the outreach coordinator for your town, so hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of him. Um, so to give you an overview of Sacred to School, uh, we have been around for 11 years. Um, it is a federally funded program, and um, in Massachusetts, we have a statewide model, and we are we work with over 50% of the eligible elementary and middle schools across the state. Um, so we are in over 200 communities and work with over uh, seven uh, over 700 schools. Um, and Moss does a lot of the kind of hands-on work. You're seeing these numbers down below that are looking at the number of events that we have held um, in different communities. And so those are our pedestrian safety trainings, our bike safety trainings, um, those kind of curriculum programmatic activities. So this is a statewide map to kind of show you where we operate. Um, we're spread out all across the state in rural communities, suburban communities, urban communities, you name it, we've got a program there and we've adapted it for what works for that community, that school, that town. Um, I'll give you a programmatic overview of what we have. We, we work on the six E's, which is education, encouragement, enforcement, evaluation, engineering, and equity. So I'll go through and kind of fill you in on what each of those entail. <coughs> so our educational programming, um, this is pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, bike rodeos, and safety assemblies. Uh, we work with um, elementary school students and middle school students, so that is teaching pedestrian safety to second graders, uh, bike safety generally to students a little bit older, but we adapt all of our models for the community that we're working in. Um, so there are options to have Moss come and do trainings himself. There are options to, to train the trainer models where um, we can either teach parents to run trainings, we can teach um, eighth graders to teach elementary school students. That's a really popular model to help facilitate some leadership development. Um, bike rodeos are a lot of fun. They usually involve more of the community uh, police departments, DPW departments to kind of bring everyone together, teaching bike safety using obstacle courses and trivia. Um, and then safety assemblies usually involve the whole school or maybe a whole grade to kind of do a larger educational curriculum. So these are just some different options for what can be implemented through a Safe Roots to School program. It can be different from town to town. It can be different from school to school. So it's really customizable. On the encouragement side of things, um, what we hold a series of flagship events. One of them is uh, coming up October 5th. It's International Walk to School Day. So we have uh, over, we generally have close to 300 schools <laughs> register for the event. Um, and that is kind of a coordinated, you know, everyone is going to walk to school that day. So we have some communities that have, walk have walkers every day or maybe they have it once a week or once a month. But we have these flagship, you know, International Walk to School Day, which is an international event. We do Winter Walk to School Day, which is a Massachusetts-based event. Uh, Minnesota also participates in that, so there's a couple of other, you know, wintry communities that embrace that. Um, and then we have Massachusetts Walk and Bike to School Day, which coordinates, which is um, in May in coordination with Bay State Bike Week. We also establish walking clubs. That tends to be popular for schools that want to embrace the Safe Routes to School model, but maybe are not a walkable school. Um, and Walk Across America, this is, you know, so we have some activity kits where Walk Across America, we have a classroom toolkit where students can track the miles that they walk and you can do a Walk Across Massachusetts, you can do a Walk Across Route 44. Um, there's a whole host of ways that you can do it to incorporate it into the teaching within the classroom. And then of course, enforcement. Partnering with local law enforcement is a really important part of any Safe Routes to School program. Um, we need to make sure that public safety is a key component of Safe Routes to School. And so our outreach coordinators are really well trained in establishing that coordination, making sure that all of our community stakeholders are at the table, 
Um, you know, whether it's talking about things like speed limits on certain roads, you know, how do you kind of bring this into the municipal policy context? Um, we don't do policy work per se, but because of our involvement in towns all across the state, we, we know what other towns are doing. We see these issues come up all the time. Um, so it's definitely valuable to use that as a resource as you're kind of tackling some of these issues, whether it's with Department of Ed or through DPW or through MassDOT or something like that. They can help facilitate those kinds of things. Um, and we also have helmet giveaways. So if there are students in your community that bike and cannot afford helmets, we can help facilitate making sure that all students have access to the safety that they need. And for evaluation, um, you know, figuring out if a program is working well is really important, especially, you know, you're starting out, getting all the schools signed on. It's a great opportunity to kind of see what a baseline is and then grow from there. Uh, so we implement a three-minute survey. We have it available in nine languages. There's online and paper versions, so it's very accessible to all parents. And it's a simple six-question survey. Uh, so I am actually going to hand it over to Moss at this point to talk about the surveys that were conducted in Norton. Great. Good evening, everybody. My name is Moss Lynch. I'm the outreach coordinator for parts of Central and Southeastern Mass. I oversee about 200 schools and 50 communities. And what we've done recently, uh, with the help of the amazing superintendent, we were able to sign on all four of the Norton Elementary Schools, the three elementary and the middle school. And what we did was we implemented what we call a parent survey. So as Nikki had talked about, the three-minute survey, which produces results. So what this means now is we've been able to hear the complaints about parents not being able to walk their children to school, hearing the complaints about there being too much speeding in the communities, not enough walking routes, and we've been able to formulate this data which shows us how students are actually getting to and from school. So looking at these maps, the different dots represent the different routes to school. So yellow represents the school buses, blue dots represent the walkers, red dots represent the drivers. And as you can see, there are almost no blue dots anywhere on these two maps or if you want to go to the next slide, the next two maps unfortunately. So our goal now is to come into Norton and work together with the community to turn these dots into blue dots, basically making less cars on the road, creating less congestion to drop off and pick up, reducing the amount of people taking the bus and showing people that there are ways to get to school, we just have to find them. So we will come into the community, we'll work with the police department, planning departments, school administration, <coughs> teachers, parents, this is completely open to the public, completely free and funded by MassDOT and we will come to the schools and we will walk every possible route, sidewalk, woods, back road, streets, to find a way in which we could create a route to school. If there are absolutely no routes that we can use to get to school, we like to do our events, our three flagship events, each, uh, each year, each school year, and we will actually block streets off using police and using the town and make those streets strictly for walkers, no cars allowed, and create those walking routes for those days throughout the year, just to get people outside, getting more exercise, and getting to and from school. What we also do is turning all of this, this data into results. If the absolute last resort is there's no way to get to school, then we want to create more programs, walking programs at the schools. So that's getting kids out, not just for recess and running around, but actually getting the kids out, doing more walking and running, biking exercises, we will teach the pedestrian safety classes. We will teach the bike assemblies. We will host bike rodeos, which are obstacle courses that mimic actual streets with stop signs, stop lines, pedestrian crosswalks, and teach the students how to use those and how to facilitate walking and biking. So our goal is to come into the town now that the school and the entire community has been signed on and turn all of this data into actual real results in which we can get the students out moving getting more exercise instead of just recess, having a more structured walking, biking assessments, having more programs, and teaching the students more on an educational level. Um, so the next element of the program is engineering. Um, so these are some pictures from projects that we have done uh, in the area, Canton, Lowell, Chelsea. Um, we last, last, maybe two years ago, completed a project in Mansfield. Um, and so engineering is an opportunity within the program. 
Um, we're currently in the process of developing a new application process for infrastructure projects for the Safe Roads to School program. So this is a couple years out, which is actually very good news for Norton because uh, you have to be part of the education and programming part of Safe Roads to School for at least one year before you're eligible to apply for an infrastructure project. So the timing should work out really well that you know, you'll be on board with the programming piece you're you know, kicking off complete streets, which is a great way to start thinking about the needs around your schools. So by the time that application process opens up, which I'm hoping is in the next year or so, um, you should be really well versed and good to go to submit um, an application. It is a competitive process that's part of, it. You know, it's a federally funded program and part of the requirements of the federal funding is that it's a competitive process. So there will be an open application process um, the application can be championed either by a town official or a school official, which is a unique thing to Safe Roots to School. Um, most MassDOT projects and federally funded projects come from the municipality. Safe Roots to School is unique in that there can be a community level champion for a project. Um, and so you will know through MOS when that process is open. Also for the municipal folks in the room, um, if you are not familiar with MAPIT, the Massachusetts Project Intake Tool, that is a new online project intake tool for all MassDOT projects moving forward. Um, for folks in the room, there are trainings going on about that right now, as well as a webinar coming up, and I can give, I have flyers with me if you need information on MAPIT. Uh, but that is all to say that for Safe Routes to School infrastructure project opportunities, um, you will know about it. It'll be spread far and wide, uh, and there will be opportunities for the public to participate in that application development process. It is a federally funded program, but it is not uh, restricted to state roads. So it is a federally funded program that local roads are eligible for. Um, so that is also a unique thing about the Safe Routes to School infrastructure program. Um, and equity is a very important component of the work that we do, both with Safe Roots to School and our work as a whole. Um, so this is, you know, in part taking in the character of the town to make sure that we are delivering a program to you that works for your community. Um, and as far as working with the schools, we're very focused, um, if you have English language learners in your community, making sure it's accessible to them, as well as inclusion of students with disabilities. Um, that is a major focus for our program this year, making sure that we're not only inclusive, but if we need to adapt our programming at all to make sure that all students can develop the skills they need to be safe and active pedestrians and bicyclists, that they have an opportunity to do that through our programming. So uh, what's next, what's coming up? Uh, we, are, we have the incorporation of the pedestrian and bike safety programs into the school since all the schools in Norton are now signed on as partners. Um, so that's where Moss will be showing his face around here a lot more often. You'll have opportunities to work with him and figure out the best way to implement safe routes to school um, throughout the town. We have uh, the middle school program, and um, as Moss said, we've looked at the parent survey results, and so we have that baseline data, and moving forward, you'll be able to develop a program off of that. Uh, so I will stop talking now, and we will open it up to questions. Moss and I are happy to address any questions you have at this time. I'm just gonna put a plug in um, before I forget. There is a new transportation planning initiatives page off the Department of Planning and Economic Development's website and healthy transportation initiatives information is on there. There will be, um, there already is presentations from previous meetings. We've talked about this kind of thing and I'll put this presentation on there as well. So, questions? I have a question. Yeah. When you say you're going to create new uh, paths, uh, you're talking about using the current infrastructure. Yes, yeah, so as far as the walking school bus routes, um, which is identifying routes to walk, and then if the town is interested, you can implement walking school buses, which that model is essentially, you identify a route that has you know, kids along it, you identify volunteers to effectively staff that route, and then it's just what it sounds. You start at one spot that's you know maybe a mile or three quarters of a mile away from the school, and along that route, you are picking up kids along the way so that by the time you get to school, you have a whole walking school bus of kids arriving there. Um, so it adds you know a social element to it. It gets kids walking together, not alone. 
Um, but yes, that is all done looking at the existing infrastructure and may be used to plan for an application for the, infra for the infrastructure component. No, I mean, this town is really, it's actually more of a rural town. Yeah. So would this actually apply to this town? I mean, yeah, there's certain segments of the town where this would work, but overall, as a, as a walking, bicycling type of program within this community, is it really feasible? Well, our program adapts to every community. Um, Moss, you may be able to speak to this more since you are working with the towns directly, but we, not every community is going to look the same. Not every school is going to look the same. You know, you've got students that are shifting in and out of school, so it's going to change over the years. Um, but we have walking school buses that use, you know, paths, that use cut-throughs. We've got ones that, you know, use sidewalks and streets the whole way. Um, it, it really is it's kind of a, a fact-finding endeavor to see what works. So it just so it now is this in conjunction, conjunction with the, the other program we were just talking about? Complete streets? So, yes, complete streets. Is this separate or is it conjunction? It can be. Yeah, so, so <laughs> some of the best complete streets applications that we've seen and some of the best complete streets prioritization plans that we've seen do really strongly incorporate safe routes to school. And I will tell you that if you are a Safe Routes to School community and you do not speak to Safe Routes to School in your Complete Streets Prioritization Plan, you will likely get a call asking you, have you thought about your schools? Um, part of a really strong Complete Streets application and prioritization plan involves looking at your schools and looking at you know, your community resources as a whole um, anyways. So they certainly go hand in hand. I think kicking off the two programs as a community together is a phenomenal way to go about these two programs uh, because they really do go, whole, go hand in hand. They aren't always approached that way. But I do think that Norton, you know, kind of kicking them off together and looking at them in tandem and the, the way they complement each other is going to make both of them much stronger programs for the town. I have one final question. Absolutely. Uh, this is federal funding. Yes. No. Uh, with, uh, are there any strings attached to this? I mean, there's usually when you're dealing with the federal government, there's more regulations. Absolutely. Than, than you could, you won't discover them for years. Right. Until they decide to enact them. Yes. So is this is no strings attached, or is this? So the education and programming piece is completely free. It's completely on us. That is no strings attached. The infrastructure side of it, like I said, it's a competitive application process that has to get scored through a rubric. Um, that will all be you know, posted online and I'm the gatekeeper of that whole process. Um, what that comes with, the town is responsible for uh, right-of-way acquisition. And the town is also responsible for being a partner in this to the extent that is holding public meetings, that is getting stakeholders around the room and being a part of the process. But with the infrastructure program, MassDOT pays for the design and construction and it is federally funded through that whole process. There isn't a match for the municipality. It's just in terms of any right-of-way acquisition and right-of-way costs. So if this should go through, in the future, we won't hear that we're in violation of something like, you know, uh, Article 9 or... or uh, in other words, it, it, well, it, yeah, I mean, it has to go through, you know, environmental and everything else, but generally, Safe Routes to School... Pro well, Safe Routes to School programs are relatively small <laughs> infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. Okay. They they generally, especially with complete streets design, they cost around a million dollars. So you're not going to get you know all of 123 to do a whole network of sidewalks to connect all of the schools with a safer to school project. It's not. They are a relic. They go on the tip, but they kind of do a, a sideways entrance to the tip. Basically, when your application is approved, you have gone through your you know, all of your regulatory procedures at that point when it's programmed. I'm going to stop you there just because you said the tip. Yes, I'm sorry. Insider mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Transportation and Improvement Program. Yes. So. Yes, thank you. Don't want to um, scare everyone, but we know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, my apologies. And so going off what Nikki said, a lot of times when we're doing complete street projects and infrastructure projects, they look at how involved the town is and what data they already have and how much less work they have to do in terms of traffic studies and data data involvement. And what's great with working with Safe Routes to Schools, because we are a free program, we provide those maps, we collect that data, we do those programs. And regardless of if you have sidewalks for people to walk to school or bike lanes for people to bike throughout the community, people are still doing it. 
kids are still doing it. Kids are still walking, they're still playing in their neighborhoods, they're still playing on their streets. So our goal is to kind of come in, educate everybody on the process and how to walk, how to bike safely, collect that data, and then when it's time to start looking at infrastructure projects, all of that is already done. They say, well, the schools have signed on, the kids have been educated, the students know how to walk and bike safely, the infrastructure data has been collected, we've done traffic studies, we see what works, we see what doesn't, now we know where to put everything. Now we can start talking about a different level of infrastructure because we're building that foundation now by starting now so that come next fall, <coughs> when if you are able to apply for the infrastructure, all of that groundwork is already done. So that's where I come in, where it's boots on the ground, come in hands-on, physically teaching, working with the students, working with the communities, so that all of that process is completed by the time it's time to start looking at the more in-depth infrastructure projects. If I could, it would seem in, in like, apparently a question of evaluation in terms of home location, but to follow up with, with something that was said earlier, it would seem to me that for the safe routes to school, one of the key criteria to make it um, necessary would be housing density and proximity to schools. Norton has no housing density. Um, Right, so are you referring to the, the programming side of it or the infrastructure side? Or the well, program? the programming, you know, before going to the infrastructure, my point is simply that there's not a, um, a, a large density of right. housing that would have school-aged children that would then create a both need and a possibility to create infrastructure to get them to school. And, I, and right. that's the concern I'd have as, in terms of applicability of the norm. Yes, so as far, as I said, it's a competitive process for the infrastructure side and the, the number of kids that would be, you know, increased walking and biking to school is certainly a factor in that scoring criteria. Um, so that may make it more difficult for Norton to get the infrastructure project. But as far as the programming and education side, which is, you know, compl a completely free service, um, we have, I mean, we are all over the Berkshires. We have, we are in some of the most rural communities in Massachusetts that, you know, the, there's no kid that lives within a couple of miles of their school, but their Safe Routes to School program might be a walking club that meets before school or after school. And so the, the education piece, you know, everyone is going to be a pedestrian at some point. Um, even if it's not going to and from school, these are these are skills that kids should be learning early on. Um, so that's the standpoint that we take: is that from the from the programming side, there is no school that cannot be a safe routes to school school. Um, it might look different. So it might not actually be developing those walking routes to and from school. Maybe it's just doing those trainings. And maybe it is focusing more on the leadership opportunities of having your middle schoolers teach your, your elementary school students. And so you're, you're achieving the same goal, but you're finding different ways to go about it. Um, so, so that's where it really is customizable to the community. But yes, on the infrastructure side, it definitely looks at increasing the rates of students walking and biking to school as a criteria. Um, and, you know, we've got funding that we, we can only do so many projects a year. Um, so that also depends on how many applications we receive. The last time we had an application process was 2014. So we do anticipate the infrastructure application process will be very competitive this go around. Um, but that's also where launching this program with your Complete Streets program is a great way to be looking at what your community can do. Because even if it's not looking at improving infrastructure through you know, a federally funded program or a state funding program, you might be looking at your next town master plan or something like that. And this might play a role in that. Maybe, it has, you know, maybe it's, it's just looking different. Um, but our, our understanding is that kids should learn how to be safe pedestrians no matter where they live and no matter how often they're walking or biking. Because at some point, that's a life skill that they should have. So this is something we would, you know, you would look at all aspects of that, both the programming side as well as the infrastructure. Right. You know, I don't know how, obviously each school is different, each neighborhood is different, yeah. to, to Joe's point, in terms of the density and school-age children living around the school, mm -hmm. what makes sense? You know, is it a half mile radius? Is it a mile radius? How far out do you go? Um, you know, I'm sure each, each town and community is probably slightly different to that end. Absolutely, um, and you know, we have communities that love biking. 
you know, the towns are just really invested in biking, and they have these bike trains, which is, you know, a walking school bus, but with bicycles, yeah. that have hundreds of kids, and we just go, okay, well, if that's what the town's really committed to, great, we'll make bike trains for you. But then there's other towns that, you know, no, we are not, we're not doing biking, we're not going that route, that's fine. We're not here to impose what does or doesn't work in other places. What is it that you want to do? And from working in over 200 communities, we've got the breadth of, you know, everything from as rural as it gets to as densely populated and urban as it gets and everything in between. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you could look at the biking side of it as opposed to just the, the, the walking piece, you right. know? Yeah. Yes. Just as a, a piece of information, that the, the mobility rate for us as a school population is on the LGN side of town. So that's actually where we're seeing our increase in population in the K to three grade grades mm -hmm. levels, not on the JCS side of town. That's the last three years of statistics for us. So we're seeing typically a mobility rate for this community over 15 years of data collected by DESI was 0.25%, which is very low mobility. That's kids coming in and out. Yep. We're averaging about 3% now, which is still a very small number, but it's just showing you that, that there is movement somewhere within apartments, homes, condos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second part is that, uh, you know, we currently have 15 buses to transport students in the district, and part of that is because we don't have neighborhood schools, right? So we, we don't have the traditional K to five uh, neighborhood schools where, for example, it'd be K to five on this side of town, K to five middle of the town, K to five on the other side of town. And so what happens is, we end up with more busing as a district right away beginning in fourth grade because fourth grade becomes a school where everybody in the town goes to, not a neighborhood school. So your routes areas for biking and walking become really only two elementary schools right. because the four, five, six, eight, nine, twelve are just too far away. They're gonna be for, for certain families, for a good number of our families. For example, the middle school with uh, 500 and 600 students in general is uh, takes up 14 of our 15 buses to make a route. Um, so, you know, and then that does it include the the disastrous, you know, drop offs and pickups that takes place every day. So just some some statistics in terms of walk to school and all of that stuff. It's really two schools that are an emphasis for us right. uh, because the others become a little bit more difficult. Although there are parts of populations of students that could do that, it just wouldn't necessarily be open to everybody because of transportation mileage if you will. So what's really great with that too is when we work in communities like this, for the schools that have an opportunity to walk or bike to school, we would really capitalize on showing those statistics for infrastructure projects, but for other schools to make sure that everyone is included, we would do walking clubs or daily, weekly walking events at the school to make sure it's open to everyone. We have schools that have absolutely no sidewalks, no bike lanes, it's absolutely impossible to get to and from school safely. So we take the kids out during a PE class, health class, and we team up with the teachers and the staff at the school to make that walk at school event. And we bring items, we bring reflective gear to keep the kids safe. We do helmet giveaways. We make it fun for the students that don't have the opportunities to actually walk to school. We make sure that we do something at the school that could be as equally as fun as walking to school. Yes. I think we have to keep in mind too the construction of the bike path. Yes. And that's going to change a lot of things. Uh, East Main Street from here all the way to 495 will have sidewalks or sidewalks. Right. That's going to open up an opportunity for high school, Yale school um, students. If they live in the Grove State, they may come down the right path and come down Main Street. Right. Go to school. Same with the LG. I mean, for the most part, it's going to open up another opportunity for people to use other, you know, for traffic or, or, or bicycle transportation. Absolutely. And one factor that I just keep thinking about is I live on Pine Street, which is right across yep. the street, and uh, Wheaton College. You can't, I can't begin to tell you how many people from Wheaton use Pine Street as a jogging path or as a, as a, as a walking path. <coughs> and with the uh, introduction of the bike path and up on Plain Street, uh, I think it's going to be even more, more so. So some of those factors have to be taken into account. Well, I think that that's a great point, too, because um, one of the things that we see sometimes with Safe Routes to School is that, you know, it's one of those things, more visibility, particularly in a community like Norton, where you're not, and um, full disclosure, my father lives in Norton, so I'm familiar with the town. Um, but so, um, 
you know, in a community that doesn't have a lot of walkers and bikers, and you know, you're not, con you know, in Boston, you've got them all on all sides of you, so you're used to looking for them. Something like Safe Routes to School is a way to start introducing the idea of looking at multimodal transportation when you are a driver or, you know, when you're a pedestrian or a biker. Um, so it really makes it more accessible for the whole community. So things like introduction to the bike path and adding more sidewalks just as part of what's going on anyways. Um, when people start paying attention to the littlest people in their community using those modes, um, it, it tends to trickle up and become more of a community level involvement. Um, you know, we had a, a yard sign contest last year for the first time, which will become an annual event where kids in elementary and middle school submitted, you know, yard sign art designs for, you know, slow down, there's kids here, there's a school here, and we printed up the top four winners, distributed them across the state, so now in these communities where in school zones you start to see these signs that were created by kids in your own community, it starts to establish more of an awareness to pay attention to things like your speed on these roads and, and looking for bikers and things like that. Yes. Um, when Joe was saying that the LG school is the one where he's seeing the spike, and it plays in perfect because it's the one school we actually own the roads around it. So with what Bob said with the bike trail, with the bike lanes and sidewalks on 123, I would envision that our target would be Plain Street, Pine Street, um, South um, Washington Street mm -hmm. to get a loop complete there. And we can come in, so that's why we like to do these, the data, we love these presentations, because with, with all these ideas, we can put them together, we'll actually come and walk the routes, we'll walk with DPW, we'll walk with infrastructure departments, police, and we'll get all the departments on board, and we'll, we'll do those physical walks and figure out the best way we can create that route. I think it's a great, like she said, you know, putting the complete streets endlessly across the school together, it gives us the chance to sort of test <coughs> these ideas as we go and we plan. So mm -hmm. sometimes when we plan as a planner, we put things on paper and it's all just lines and talk, but if we're going out there with the kids and we're really experiencing this as we build it too, as Bob was saying, there's a lot of projects in the pipeline. You know, we have, like 274 East Maine brought a lot of housing online. Um, kids, I see them lined up with clustered packages. So. I'm excited about working with everyone. It's really great. And as I was saying, you know, going off that, the, the reason why we do public meetings is because we want to bring the public on board. We don't want to make it private. We want to hear all the complaints and all the reasons why it won't work, so we can at least try and find one way to make it work. Maybe a question for Jetta as well. Is there any deadlines or timelines that we should be made aware of? Um, end dates to either program, you know, anything like that? Is there certain, you know, I get the educational portion, we go all year round. Okay. Yeah. So we're teaching classes uh, all throughout the summer. We do summer programs, after school programs, weekend events, night events. Mm -hmm. uh, for the infrastructure, that's more Nikki's side, but the educational portion is all year round. Okay. Yeah, and um, our Sacred to School model is unique. Uh, most, so we are one of very few statewide models. Uh, basically, there's a pot of federal money um, that used to be specifically dedicated to Safe Routes to School. It's now been kind of stuck into a block grant type of pot of money. Um, and in Massachusetts, we decide to take, it's called TAP, Transportation Alternatives Program. We take all of our TAP money and we put it all into Safe Routes to School. We just decided that that is what our priority is, that is what we're using it for, that's how we have a statewide model with so many community partners and how we have a staff of seven outreach coordinators. Um, and so, yeah, that's not going away anytime soon. No matter what happens with any sort of federal funding levels around transportation, um, we've, as a state, we've committed to the Safe Routes to School program. Um, as I said, you'll know when that application comes online. I would expect it will be in about a year, um, just from, you know, we're we're signing contracts and stuff. We have to get it all built and everything else. Um, but that will be very broadly advertised. You'll know what that window of time is to apply. Um, and by working with MOSS, you'll have a lot of the materials ready to go. Um, 
I don't know if you want to add anything about Complete Streets. Right, so Complete Streets, um, that first tier where you're just um, adopting the policy, that's an ongoing and a rolling deadline, so there really isn't one there. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part, uh, you generally have about six months to put together a project yeah. list. Yeah. Um, so it all depends on when we get started, when we actually get the contract from SRT. And then tier three, um, there's two funding uh, opportunities for construction funds. So there's a May 1st deadline and there's an October 1st deadline. Um, so, and that's every year um, for the next two years anyway, and then hopefully they'll continue the funding. Okay, thank you. The deadline. Mm -hmm. yes. just, just as a comment, I know we've been talking and as the superintendent a lot about the schools and just, you know, walking to school and busing and everything else, but I think that the general sense that I get um, also the community I live in is that things like infrastructure also allow for a growing senior population Absolutely. to use potentially before school and after school hours during the school year. We have a lot of folks who go <coughs> up to the high school now um, and walk to school before school and even sometimes during school and we've been okay with that in general um, and then after school. Um, so any, any way that we get can get folks, uh, especially to utilize the facility. Some of the facilities, the grounds aren't, aren't perfect for walking per se, but mm -hmm. it allows for a growing senior population to also be safer using our streets, not just streets. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure, sir, if you <coughs> yeah. uh, It was mentioned earlier about these uh, rain, uh, the speed, uh, speed signs. Yes. The solar speed signs and the permanent signs that are yep. put in different uh, areas. I recently run into a few in Sharon where driving through Sharon, uh, every once in a while I hit one, it, it kind of reminds you. The rapid maybe, flashing beacons. Yeah, it kind of, it's got a little red light to kind of remind you. And I, I may be doing three or four miles an hour over the speed limit, but it's a fact that it reminds me that we do have a speed limit. Right. And I think there are certain areas like Plain is meant Pine, Plain, Reservoir, any of these new streets we've paid recently uh, seem to be uh, racetracks these days. And uh, I, I think it's just something that if we as a community, if we have the ability to get some of those, signs put up in strategic areas, I think it's very important. Yeah, those are on the Complete Streets eligibility, right? I was just going to say that, yeah. It's very on the list popular. as an eligible project type. Yeah. yeah. And that was, in Sharon was actually a personal project that I worked on last year. <laughs> so when we flipped on the Ames and Pond Street in that intersection right by the high school, I actually right. put that sign in. Uh, we, they applied, for, Sharon did uh, apply for Complete Streets. They didn't get a lot of the funding that they wanted, but we were able to work with the engineering department and they had some extra money to put in flashing beacons on the stop signs and paint some crosswalks. Mm -hmm. So there are there are a lot of opportunities for more infrastructure. So even if at this very moment you're not getting a million dollar sidewalk put in, there are ways to work with you know planners and engineers to discuss alternatives to putting those in. And that was a quick overnight project. You know we did it and painted the crosswalks. They were ready in time for school. We put in those flashing lights. I'm very proud of that. Uh, it took a lot of work. We did it in the pouring rain because that's when we really saw the true drivers and the ones thinking they can get away with going 40, 50 an hour down the street because no one's paying attention and we had cops at every corner watching and it was a, it was a fun project. Just the average cost for those was a flashing stop sign or the uh, speed limit signs. What's the average going for that? Oh, um, 5,000 each, so you need two of them. Yeah, Is it? that's what I've heard too, it's yeah. 5,000 yeah. each. So. And you need one on either side, something like that. And that's not with the markup for labor. I want to say it's like $20,000. Yeah. Yeah, around that. Well, wow. I, I live in housing and I'm on board there. We just, we're in the middle of putting something like that in on uh, West Main Street and it, it was around $9,000 okay. for the two wow. signs. That's just the, the right. stuff itself though, just the not stuff the, itself. the yeah. yeah, the town is helping us. So I, I think, if I'm thinking correctly, I'm thinking of like a full set of four where it would be on either side of the school zone both ways, and I think that that's around 20,000, so nine, that, yeah, about 10,000 pair. Yeah. I just want to confirm, you're talking about the, of the a stop sign or anything, any sort of alert flashing sign that reminds uh, like a stop sign, but it's, it's solar powered with these yes. lights. They talk, they're four thousand dollars a piece. Uh, who, who supplies these uh, these uh, lights? I'm not. I'm not sure the supply chains are and how how many. Yeah. Let me talk to the vendor. I'll run them down. Yeah. 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 Transportation is expensive. 
Yeah. <laughs> sure, I, I, a lot of things are expensive, but project. some things are just... Yeah, yeah. 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 Safe routes to school are, are, are very small infrastructure projects for MassDOT, and we run around a million dollars each, and they tend to be, you know, within a mile of schools there. Um, but yeah, that's that's the price tag we look at. So, yeah. This is kind of the crossover between the two programs, because Complete Streets is just town and local and roads, while well, this can kind of go across a little bit of everything. Yeah. In the event that we're looking at a project where say Fruits School doesn't make it through the bidding process and doesn't get any funding, the fact that it's through MassDOT and through the state, does that assist with any of the organization and red tape in terms of getting the project completed in some other way? Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not sure if what I'm going to say directly answers your question, but I'm going to try. Um, so something that we see a lot more often now is a lot of towns are combining complete streets and safe routes to school, or they're combining a larger, um, one of the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program projects, that is one of your federally funded on state road projects with a local project. Um, and we're seeing that, and that is very favorable to MassDOT. Um, we, we really like seeing this collaboration move forward. Um, an example is the town of Medford was recently awarded um, a Safe Roots to School program, and, or, or Safe Roots to School infrastructure project. And uh, we awarded the project that had been scoped and whatnot, but long story short, they got the complete streets money faster and said, we're planning to address this part in front of the school with our complete streets money. Can we move the Safe Routes to School project a little bit down the road to finish out the rest of that corridor? Um, so we were able to kind of put the two projects together to have a more comprehensive project that used the two separate funding sources. Um, in Stoughton right now, um, over on West Street in Stoughton, if you're familiar with that area, they had two TIP projects, I believe it was around Turnpike Street and Pearl Street. Um, and so then there was this middle piece um, that wasn't, that didn't have the work done right in front of the elementary school. So one side of the road is being completed with com complete streets funding, and the other side of the road is being completed with a Safe Routes to School project. So that's four projects, a combination of state funding, federal funding, and three different programs that are creating kind of a full comprehensive roadway. Um, and so we're seeing that kind of creativity a lot more often. Incorporating this into your Complete Streets Prioritization Plan is going to make your planning a lot easier later on. Um, the other thing too, you know, you're involved with SERPED, so whether or not Norton sees a lot of these large federally funded projects <coughs> or not, um, a lot of times there's small money kind of left hanging that needs a quick project to fill the gap. And so by working with the uh, SERPED MPO, the Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, you know, if you have those all kind of geared up, you know, you have them in the pipeline, you're thinking about them, it does make it quicker to put the, pro the idea forward to get kind of rallying behind the design for that and get projects through. So I hope that that might answer your question a little bit. I think it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You say first to school, if you go along and you find an area where you're going off the beaten path, yes. so to speak, what is the criteria going to be for that pathway to turn into so that it's ADA accessible? So what we've been doing a lot uh, is working with the Department of Infrastructure and Department of Public Works, and we've we're trying to, we are making every possible way to make everything ADA accessible because we don't want to make any paths that wouldn't be ADA accessible because then that would be completely pointless of what we're trying to do. And we're, we've been working in Central Mass in a community in Medway, and what we're doing is creating some walking routes, and we ran into some issues that a lot of the routes weren't ADA accessible, so we brought on the town planners and the infrastructure department, and now they're actually looking at repaving fixing the cracks, fixing the potholes, making sure that they are ADA compliant in every possible way. And what do you do about the incline and the decline? It's so, into consideration? 
<laughs> yeah, we do, we do. And a lot of times uh, they're actually installing uh, rubber stops at the tops and bottoms of the inclines and they are working on alternative roundabout ways instead of going up and down, trying to go around and find different routes to circumvent the, the inclines because we have run into those issues too. Thank you for coming in. Right. I have a, uh, plenty of packets of information I'm going to just leave right up here. Yeah. For if anybody wants to take them at the end, uh, please feel free to reach out to and us. That's our contact. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, in terms of planning board, we're pretty much wrapped up. Uh, we did have to send a plan down. I got it. Okay, okay. so we're good. Uh, other than that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Aye.